lecture is on the reproductive and pelvic anatomy. We'll be focusing mostly on the internal and external organs, briefly talking about the ligaments that connect them, and finally the blood supply. What we'll be talking about first is a vulva. The vulva consists of all the structures from the mons pubis to the perineum. So from here to here. Some of the structures include the pubis, the labia minora, majora, the clitoris, Bartholin's glands, vaginal opening, urethral opening, and skein glands, also known as the periurethral glands. This is a good time to briefly discuss a clinical vignette about the Bartholin's glands. The Bartholin's glands can become obstructed, leading to the formation of either a painless cyst or a painful abscess. That's a key distinction, whether or not there's pain. An asymptomatic Bartholin cyst typically does not require the treatment. The exception would be in a woman who is older than 40 years old. This woman can get drainage and biopsy to rule out malignancy. Also, any sign of malignancy would be an indication for a biopsy. If the cyst is in any way symptomatic, or if it's an abscess, then the first line treatment is an incision and drainage, and, if you would like, the addition of a word catheter. If that fails, you can try marsupialization. Marsupialization is when a slit is cut into the abscess, then the edges are sutured so the slit remains open, allowing the cyst or abscess to drain freely. Now we'll be talking about the internal organs. To briefly give you an overview, we have the vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, and finally, the ovaries. Let's take a closer look at the vagina and the cervix. The vagina connects the vulva, which would be down here, to the cervix. And the cervix consists of the following. You have the ectocervix, right here, which is a part of the cervix that's visible through the vaginal canal. This is what you'll see during a speculum exam. It's composed of stratified, non-keratinized squamous epithelium. Then you have the endocervix over here. This is the canal that connects the vagina to the uterus. It is made out of a columnar epithelium. The endocervix is surrounded by the external os and the internal os. The area between the ectocervix and endocervix has a squamo-columnar junction. So this little transition zone right here. And it contains what's called the transformation zone where most instances of cervical cancer arise from. If the patient does have an abnormal pap smear that requires a loop excision, the entire transformation zone must be completely excised. Now let's talk about the uterus. The uterus lies behind the bladder and in front of the rectum. The four parts of the uterus include the corpus, which is the body of the uterus, the cornu, which is sort of like the corners, and are where the fallopian tubes connect to the uterus, and the fundus, which is the uppermost region of the uterus. The uterus is made of two types of tissues, the outer myometrium, which is smooth muscle, and endometrium, which is a mucosal layer made of columnar epithelium. Here we have the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube consists of the fimbriae, the infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus, and intramural segment. Sometimes it helps to remember the name by thinking fimbria as little fingers, and the infundibulum as a funnel. The ampulla is the widest part of the fallopian tube, and this is actually where most ectopic pregnancies occur. And the isthmus is the thinnest section of the fallopian tubes. And of course, we have the ovaries. The ovaries are covered by a fibrous capsule called the tunica albuginea, which itself is covered by a germinal epithelium. Of note is the fact that the ovaries are not covered by peritoneum. This is what makes it so easy for ovarian cancer to spread into the abdomen. Here we have all the ligaments. The ligaments can always be a little confusing and hard to remember, but I feel like if you take the time to think it out, and more importantly draw it out, it should stick in your head. 
So the ligaments could be divided into three categories. First, you have the broad ligament. Then you have the ovarian ligaments, which consist of the ovarian ligament and the suspensory ligament, which is also known as the infundibulopelvic ligament. The third category of ligaments include the uterine ligaments, which have the crown ligament, the cardinal, aka the transverse cervical ligament, and the pubocervical and the uterocervical ligaments, which aren't pictured here. The broad ligament is a sheet of peritoneum that folds over the uterus and covers mostly everything. To be more specific, it covers the uterus, fallopian tubes, round ligament, ovarian ligament, suspensory ligament of the ovaries, uterine and ovarian blood supply, and the ureters. However, it's important to remember that this is peritoneum, and because it's peritoneum, it does not cover the ovaries. So the broad ligament connects all of this to the lateral pelvic wall. The broad ligament can be divided into three sections. It's not very important to remember these for your shelf exam, but just in case you want a brief refresher, you have the mesometrium, which covers the uterus. You have the meso-ovarium, which covers the neurovascular supply to the ovaries. And you have the mesosalpinx, which covers the fallopian tubes. Next, we have the ovarian ligament, which is right here. This connects the ovary to the uterus, just below the origin of the fallopian tubes. It's one of my favorite ligaments because it's just so plain easy. Then we have the suspensory ligament of the ovary, which is right here. It connects the ovary to the lateral pelvic wall. It contains all the arteries, veins, nerves, and lymphatic vessels that supply the ovaries. A large ovary, especially one with like a giant cyst on it, can actually cause the suspensory ligament of the ovary to twist, which leads to the blood supply being cut off and causing a condition called torsion of the ovaries. This requires prompt surgical management to untwist the ovary in order to save it. Next we have the round ligament, We're over here, which connects the uterus from the cornu, right here, through the inguinal canal to the labia majora. During pregnancy, this ligament can be stretched leading to pain that increases with movement and decreases with rest. It is a diagnosis of exclusion and can be treated with rest and acetaminophen. Next we have the cardinal ligament, which is all this right here, also called the transverse or cervical ligament. They are below the broad ligament and connect the lateral vagina and cervix to the pelvic sidewall. This ligament contains the uterine artery and uterine veins. In surgery, it's always important to remember that the ureter passes posteriorly to the uterine artery. A common mnemonic used is water passes under the bridge. In this case, urine is the water and blood is the bridge. Now let's take a different look to get a different view of the remaining ligaments. We have the pubocervical ligament, here and here. This connects the cervix to the posterior surface of the pubic symphysis. Then we have the uterosacral ligaments, here and here. This connects the cervix as well, but this time it comes posteriorly to the sacrum. The final topic of this lecture is the blood supply to the ovaries and the uterus. If you remember from your anatomy class, the air that travels along the left side of the body and splits into the common iliac, here and here, which itself splits into the internal and the external iliac. It's actually the internal iliac that will eventually give rise to the uterine artery and the vaginal artery. The ovaries get their blood supply directly from the aorta, as you can see here and here. The venous drainage for the ovaries is a little slightly more complicated and a little asymmetric. On the patient's right side, which is your left, the ovarian vein connects directly to the inferior vena cava. And this makes sense because the inferior vena cava is actually closer to the patient's right side. On the patient's left side, the ovarian vein actually connects first to the renal vein, 
which then itself goes to the inferior vena cava. And remember, the ovarian vein and artery both travel through the suspensory ligament of the ovaries. Okay, that's all for today's lecture on anatomy. I hope it served as a good refresher and a good foundation for your OBGYN clerkship.